All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and welcome to today's DCMI ACES joint webinar with Ruben Verberg, titled Linked Data Fragments, Querying Multiple Linked Data Sources on the Web. Uh, my name is Stuart Sutton and I'm the Managing Director of DCMI and it's my pleasure this morning or today uh, to introduce the webinar and our presenter. I'll also moderate the Q&A at the close of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and is scheduled for one hour 15 minutes. That's approximately one hour for presentation and 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Today's webinar uh, with Ruben Verberg will introduce you to linked data fragments family of technologies. This family is premised on a fundamentally pragmatic view of the web of data and scalable linked data publishing and querying on the web. Uh, Ruben will cover the principles of linked data fragments and the potential of what this technology has to offer. Ruben holds a PhD in computer science engineering from Ghent University, Belgium, where he serves as a researcher in semantic hypermedia. He is also a postdoctoral fellow of the Research Foundation Flanders. Ruben co-authored two books on linked data and has contributed to more than 140 publications on web-related topics for international conferences and journals. So welcome Ruben and I turn the webinar over to you. Thank you Stuart. Um, hi everybody, welcome to this webinar on linked data fragments. I'm excited to see that so many of you um, have joined and some are still joining. So let's get started. Um, the main thing we're going to talk about today is, is the following. I suppose that a lot of you work at institutions where you have um, interesting linked data, sometimes even a big deal of, of linked data, huge data sets. But many people wonder, um, how do I put this data on the web? What is the best way to publish this? And with best way, I mean um, the best way for people to consume it. But it should also be realistic for those publishing the data, like is this sustainable? Is this um, sufficiently cost effective, for instance? Now, as I'm sure that, that you, you probably know, there's different alternatives to do that at the moment. Um, for instance, you, you could set up a public Sparkle endpoint, and then basically you give all the power to your users. They can do a lot of things, but of course it will um, come at a cost if you have to pay for that server. So it is one option, but maybe not the option for all cases. Another way to think about this as well, you could just offer a data dump. So let's say every month you generate all the triples that you have, you put them into a file, you release them, and then your users can do with them whatever they want. Okay, fair enough, but that is not really web querying, if you ask me, because um, users, they download all of your data, then they have to set up their own endpoint, and what they are querying, in essence, is your data, but they're not really querying the web. Plus, if um, they want to query multiple data sets at the same time, they need to download multiple dumps, and it becomes more and more complicated. For instance, how are they going to keep these dumps um, up to date? How are they going to ensure that everything works as a publisher intended? So, second alternative, but again, does not work in, in all cases. Um, and there's a third alternative you might have heard about, which is linked data documents. Um, they're the so-called green pages from DBpedia, for instance where you have uh, one page per um, subject. Even though they're not specifically made for querying, you can execute queries over them, but they will be very slow. That's the kind of trade-off. But this interface is very cheap for um, the server, and it's really web querying. So what these three examples show, basically, is that there will always be trade-offs if we query like data on the web. So I'm not going to present you today a magical solution that takes away all of the problems that you could imagine. Instead, um, I'll encourage you to think differently about all the trade-offs that we can have. Maybe there's different combinations that we haven't tried before or thought of before. So today is going to be about trade-offs. Like we know we cannot have everything, but have we looked at all possible interesting combinations that we might have? So um, what we've been working on um, the past two, three years with the team here in, at Ghent University, IMI in Belgium, is um, a way of, of having simpler servers 
and having more intelligent clients. Or to say it differently, if you start from a Sparkle endpoint where all intelligence is basically in the server, we try to get as much intelligence as possible out of the server and put it into the client. That said, if you just take all intelligence out of the server and put it on the client, we again have a data dump. So we're looking for a compromise somewhere in between. But this is something I'll explain um, more about later on. So affordable link data live on the web. We want to query it, and we want to query multiple sources at once. That says today's webinar has um, three main parts. The first part is about link data fragments itself. It's about a conceptual framework that we've created to analyze link data interfaces and to create new kinds of link data interfaces. That's the first part. The um, second part is okay. Given that we have data published in such an interface. How can we execute queries over that? And how can we execute queries over multiple of these interfaces? Because real web querying means that we can combine information from different sources together. And finally, I'll um, give a very practical overview about what you need if you want to start publishing um, linked data in the way that, that we suggest. So uh, those are three parts. Um, but before we start with the first one, um, let me first give some brief introduction about all the concepts to make sure that we're all starting on the same page. So um, of course, RDF, the Resource Description Framework, um, is a data model which captures knowledge information as terms. So for instance, the examples that we have here is um, we're describing a scholarly article. Um, the name of which is World Wide Web, and that has been written by, by three people. So you see the typical RDF elements. Um, each triple consists of, of course, three parts. There's a subject, there's a predicate, and there's an object. The um, predicates, we try to reuse them as much as possible because they give meaning. They are unique identifiers that uh, make sure that machines can talk to each other. And also for subjects and objects, so we try to use um, URLs so that we can look up more information as needed. That's the RDF model that you're probably all familiar with. RDF is a data model, but what we also have is a language to query um, RDF data sources, and that language is Sparkle. Now, we should be careful because Sparkle is actually two things. Um, Sparkle is the language to make such queries, and also is a protocol to execute such queries over the web. So we'll be talking today about Sparkle in those two senses, but when I say Sparkle, I'm mostly talking about the language, when I say Sparkle endpoints, I'm talking about a protocol. For instance, on this slide, we see an example query um, where we're looking for um, articles. And you notice that, in essence, the body of a Sparkle query is very similar to um, RDF triples. The main difference is that you can have uh, variables inside. For instance, this question mark article means that we're looking for this. So it's an unknown. So in this case, the query says we're looking for things that are articles that have a certain author, and the name of this author should be Tim Berners-Lee. So in this case, what we will get back from the engine is we'll get back URLs for article and URLs for this author named Tim Berners-Lee. So that's the general mechanism of RDF, the uh, modeling language, and Sparkle, the query language. Now, um, I've talked before about data dumps. So data dumps are one way to um, execute Sparkle queries. So what you do is you install and um, such a triple store um, locally, then you download a whole data dump from somewhere on the internet, you load all the triples in the triple store, and then you are ready to execute a Sparkle query. This is, of course, the very techy approach, but it's one that always works. So you just set up your own space and you can execute queries. That's one way. The other way is a Sparkle endpoint. So I talked about that before. A Sparkle endpoint, that's a Sparkle protocol. And what happens is then, while well, somebody sets up a server on the web, and basically, they do all the things that you would do locally. So they set up a triple store, they ingest the data. And then you, as a client, you can send a query to that Spark endpoint, and you will get back all of the results. So in this case, the computation happens purely on uh, the server side. And if you do this on, on a web setting, you typically have a public Sparkle endpoint. So that's an endpoint where anybody can ask uh, questions. Um, private endpoints also exist, but in this webinar, it's really about publishing data on a public space like the web, so we'll mostly be talking about public spot endpoints. So these were the three concepts I wanted to introduce. So um, let's get started with the first part, which is about linked data fragments, a conceptual framework to think about um, publishing linked data on the web. 
So in general, when I say interface on the web, um, what we're then talking about is, is the um, three-layer architecture um, to build a web application. So what, very typ what typically happens is that, um, well, you see the picture right there. So there is some kind of, of database, be it a relational database, a Sparkle endpoint, no SQL database, anything. And on top of that, we put uh, a web interface. And this interface uh, is a gateway for the clients to execute queries on the database. Because um, if you don't have such a gateway, the client has to know the database schema, right? And also, um, the web interface makes sure that the client cannot ask queries it is not authorized to ask. For instance, um, data it cannot access, or maybe queries that would take too much time to process. So the web interface is an abstraction on top of the database that ensures that the client does not need to know about the internals, and also the client cannot do anything wrong, so to speak. That's a very typical scenario for, I'd say, 99.9% .9 of the web applications that we all use every day. Now, of course, why don't you go directly to the database? Well, this is something that um, no web developer would typically do. Um, even if you're just starting out in web development, you learn to work with, let's say, PHP and, and MySQL, you never give your clients direct access. Why? Well, if you give them direct access, if they can bypass the interface, they must know all internals about the database and they can ask anything. And being able to ask anything also means they can ask really complex queries that could bring your system down. So in all cases that I know, um, there will always be a web interface. In all cases, well, actually, there's one exception and they are Sparkle endpoints. Because if you think about it, what Sparkle Endpoint really does is it gives the clients direct access to Triple Store. The Sparkle protocol is a very lightweight um, gateway in the sense that it just takes a query, sends it to the database, and, and gives it back. So it's almost like the client is directly querying the, the Triple Store. And well, partly this actually makes sense because uh, with RDF being schema neutral, we can say, well, okay, the, the client does not have to know the database schema, it's just RDF, it can discover it. Fair enough, but the other point still remains. Clients can still ask any query. They're still free to, do, to ask whatever they want to do, and this might not be a great idea because the result of that is indeed that we see um, a two-sided availability problem with Sparkle endpoints. I guess that you've um, heard a lot about availability in Sparkle endpoints, well, um, there's actually two sides to the story. First of all is because clients can ask such complex queries, Sparkle endpoints are expensive. You just give a lot of power to um, a client, so it's not, uh, I mean, it's easy to understand that, that the lead is expensive if they can't ask just anything. So that's one thing, there are not a lot of Sparkle endpoints because they're expensive. The other thing is those endpoints that exist, they suffer from frequent downtime. Now, the um, average public Sparkle endpoint is down for one and a half days each month. That's a study that has been done in 2013, and that's quite a lot, actually, because one and a half days each month, that means that, well, if you're going to build an application on top of that, this application will be down for at least one and a half days each month. So that's not a great uh, starting point, so to say. So that's the availability problem of Sparkle endpoints. Um, and if we try to query multiple Sparkle endpoints at once, it becomes worse because in the worst case, if you have two endpoints, well, they're down three days each month. And if you have three endpoints, that's almost five days. In other words, if you have a query that uses three data sources, if you use public Sparkle endpoints for that, don't bother building a public application because it will just be down way too much to, um, to really be usable. So this is sadly the current state of a lot of linked data on the web that um, querying is, is quite hard. And now, of course, as we discussed before, a solution to this is, well, don't set up a Sparkle endpoint, just um, offer a data dump. Make one big zip file of all your triples every month, and then people can do whatever they want. Okay, but this means that your users would need a technical background to set up all of the infrastructure. That's one thing. And also, what if you're thinking about casual usage and mobile devices, like I want to quickly query something. Do I really have to download the whole dump at once? Or to say it in other words, if, if you want to read something on Wikipedia, do you first download the whole encyclopedia and then only start looking at one page locally? Of course not. That's not how the web works. 
So this is why I say that data dumps are not really web query. Yes, they solve the availability problem because you put your responsibility on the clients, but I mean, it's it's a way out. It's not really a solution to querying on the web. Now, what we've been doing is is that um, we said that we need much more UX because traditionally um, querying linked data on the web has always been presented either as a sparkle endpoint or either as a data dump. Either you go all the way or you let the client to aggregate. So this means that if you have a sparkle endpoint, while well, the service is going to be expensive, the client is going to be cheap, availability is going to be hard. Um, you don't need a lot of bandwidth, and your data is live. If you look at a data dump, while well, the server there costs um, very few actually, but um, the client cost becomes high, both in um, infrastructure and knowledge. Availability is fully in control of the clients. The bandwidth required is very high because you need to send this big dump over the wire every time. And data can get outdated fast because it's only monthly or, or yearly, whatever, release of the data. And basically, it used to be the case that you had just those two choices, like either a term, either an endpoint. But what we're saying is that let's have a look at all the interfaces in between. Can we bring somehow more nuance to the story? Can we do something different than just those two extremes? What we've created is a conceptual framework to reason about different interfaces to publish RDF. And this means those interfaces that already exist such as data dumps and sparkle endpoints, but also new interfaces that have not been created yet. And this framework is actually really simple because it has this, the observation that what all interfaces to publish linked data have in common is that in one way or another, they create specific fragments of a data set. They take specific parts. For instance, a sparkle endpoints allows me to take very, very specific parts. I can ask almost any query. A data dump allows me to just get one part of the data set, like give me all triples that are in there. And that's something all interfaces do one way or another. They allow users to select specific parts, specific fragments of the data set. More concretely, um, each of those fragments, we give them three characteristics. So each type of interface has a certain type of fragments, and they have three characteristics as follows. First of all, of course, there's the data. What kind of triples are in there? That's straightforward, but we also have metadata. Um, what do we know about those triples? Maybe there's extra data describing the data that we have. The third part is controls, which are um, pieces of information that give us access to more data. For instance, um, if a data dump consists of multiple parts, then the controls would allow you to go from one part to another. Now, that's very generic, but um, it will become clear if I apply this to concrete um, examples. For instance, if you look at the data dump, how is this a linked data fragments interface? Well, a data dump, con data dump consists of just a one big fragment that contains all the set triples as data. And sometimes there's also metadata like the number of triples in, in the zip file, the file size, and so on. And there's typically no controls to other data. Why? Well, you already have everything, so there's no need to retrieve more data. So this is how a data dump can be characterized as a linked data fragments interface. Um, if you look at, the, at um, the answer that we get back from um, a Sparkle endpoint, we can also say that, that it's a linked data fragments interface because each response you get back from a Sparkle endpoint is also a fragment. And it's a very specific fragment, namely it contains as data all those triples that exactly match the query that you've given. There's no metadata, there's no controls because you didn't ask for that. So the only data in um, a fragment from a Sparkle endpoint. Now, of course, um, thinking about all those different options, um, what if we designed um, a new kind of fragment and if we had as design goals the fact that it should be low cost and have high availability? So we want to combine um, those characteristics from both sides. We want to be able to query the system live. Um, we want to maximize the availability, and we want to minimize the, the cost on the server side. So we created such an interface, and we call this the triple pattern of fragments interface. Why do we call it triple pattern of fragments? Well, the name um, speaks for itself. What is inside such a fragments are these three things. First of all, a triple pattern of fragments interface allows you to select triples based on a triple pattern. So this means that the answer that you get back is a fragment the data of which consists of those triples that match a given pattern. For instance, if you say, I'm looking for all triples that have as a predicate DC title, 
well, then you'll get back um, those data. But, of course, they can be quite long if there's a lot of matches, so this data is paged. So a triple pattern fragments interface will always page its responses so that you never have those huge fragments. That's the first component. The second component is metadata. Inside of each page will also be the total number of matches. For instance, um, there could be, let's say, one million matches for DC title, but I'm only getting back the first hundred. Well, there will still be metadata inside explaining that in total there's a million matches. Then finally there will be controls, and this is a kind of a small system, a small form that gives us access to all other triple pattern fragments of the same data set. I realize this probably sounds um, very abstract, but um, don't despair because I'm going to make this very concrete right here. This is an example of um, a triple pattern fragment, and you can see the three parts. So first of all, what I've asked here is, give me triples where the predicate is birthplace and the object is Italy. In other words, give me things that are born in Italy. What I get back from the server is data, which you see at the bottom, and I get back the first 100 matches. Even though, as you can see just above this, in total there's 8,000 something matches. So in total there's 8,000 things born in Italy in the data set. I'm getting back the first 100. I can go to the second and third page to get more. And also note on top how I have this small form which allows me to select more data from the same data set. So this is what a triple pattern fragment is. Now to make this more tangible, I'll show this live. And actually, you can also try this in your browser. And this is the DBpedia data set which has been made available as triple pattern fragments. So what I get, and if I don't select anything, I just get all triples, and in total there's almost 400 million of them. But I can um, ask for very specific triples. For instance, I could say, um, like Einstein, for instance, give me all those triples that have Einstein as a subject. When I click the button, then I get only those triples. I get the first 100, which you can see right here. I get also a number of total triples, so even though I see only 100, there's 361 matching. And right here are the controls of the small form that I use to access the data set. Notice how I can only ask for triple patterns. I cannot ask for more complex queries, just triple patterns. Something else I could do, for instance, is uh, I could ask for triples that have Einstein as the object. There's 100 of them, for instance. And um, what I actually could do is, for instance, look for triples that have um, birthplace as a predicate. And I can even make um, combinations. For instance, if I um, want to see things born in the United States, then I can do this. And then I get um, 33,000 um, things born in the United States. And note, again, how I just get the first 100. I can get more triples if I go to the next page. So this is a concept, very simple. I'm just browsing the data set based on a triple pattern, and I can't ask anything more than this. To give another example, this was a DBpedia data set. I also have the Harvard Library data set. This is a list of books and authors from the um, Harvard um, Library. So um, I can also look for things like birth date, for instance, here. So now I'm looking at all those triples that have birth date as a property. And I can see there's 5,000 matches. So this is an example of another data set that has been published using the same mechanism. Remember those two data sets because we will come back later to them when we start. OK, so I hope I know it's clear what a triple pattern fragment is. It consists of data, metadata, and controls. And you can ask for triple patterns like the main set. Now, a um, very important disclaimer. Um, Triple pattern fragments are not the final answer to querying everywhere because, as we have discussed in the beginning, there is no interface that is the final answer. However, even though this interface is very simple, I'll show you that it's also quite powerful because there's quite a lot we can already do, even with such a very simple server. So the question is not like, OK, what are the limits and what can't we do? The question is first, what can we do with such a simple interface? And in fact, Many semantic web experts to which I have pitched the ID told me, oh, but this will not work, only to uh, see me prove them wrong. Because even though the ID sounds very simple, it can actually be quite powerful. I'll show you how this works in the second section about querying multiple linked data sources. So 
So far we've talked about the linked data fragments conceptual framework. Now let's talk about um, the triple pattern fragments interface and how we can use that to answer complex queries over multiple sources. So um, actually the different kind of interfaces, you can try them yourself because DBpedia, the well-known data set uh, of Wikipedia, is available as a data dump, as a Spark endpoint, as linked data documents, and even as a triple pattern fragments interface. So you can play around with this interface yourself at the fragments.dbpedia.org. Um, also, um, you could ask, well, how much linked data is there out there? Is it, is it just DBpedia and you guys? Well, actually, there is a thing called the lot round format, and this is basically a big um, server with um, half a million of um, data sets, and they're all available at Triple Pattern Fragments interfaces. So what happens is that a lot of them have crawls data sets from the web, cleans them, and makes them available. And this all happens on a single machine. Now, even though centralization is not our goal, it kind of shows just how lightweight the interface is. I mean, imagine having a half a million Sparkle endpoints on a single machine, that would never work. But we can happily have half a million triple pattern fragments interface hosted on a single machine. And of course, um, this is not our goal, but just so you know that there's already this many data sets available as triple pattern fragments, and you can also easily make your own data set available as we'll discuss in the end. Okay, given this data, how can we solve complex Sparkle queries over it? Because clearly, we cannot just send a Sparkle query to the server because the server only accepts triple patterns. Well, what happens is that we have an intelligent client. So the most interesting part of the computation happens client-side. So every user who wants to execute a query will bring his or her machine, and this machine will contribute to the processing power needed to find an answer. So uh, such a Sparkle query, we give it to the client. We give it the URL of any fragment of a data set. What then will happen is that the client will look inside of the fragment to see how it can access the data set. And the client will use the metadata to find a good plan to execute the query. If this sounds very abstract, don't worry. We'll make this concrete right now. For instance, this is an example query um, we have to solve. So this is a complex Sparkle query. And we're looking for um, people of type scientists, and those people need to be born in a city, and the name of the city uh, needs to be Geneva. So in human language, what we're looking for is, give me scientists that are born in cities named Geneva. I'm specifically saying cities named Geneva because there might be multiple of them. So it's not just scientists born in Geneva, Switzerland. It's scientists born in any city that might be named Geneva. Okay, so this complex Sparkle query, we give it to the client because the server cannot evaluate the complex query itself. We also give to the client a fragment to get started. In this case, this is an address of the uh, DBpedia dataset. So we say to the client, look, this is a query you have to evaluate and you have to start from this dataset. What happens next is that the client will look inside of the fragments to see what happens. So if we as humans have a look at this fragment in the browser, we'll see an explanation that says, you can query this data set by triple pattern. Indeed, if we were in the interface, we had this form in, uh, saying to us that, look, this is a type of query you can ask. Well, the same will be said to the clients. So dear clients, you cannot solve a complex Sparkle query here, but you can ask me for triple patterns. So what we've seen so far is HTML, but what the client will do actually behind the scenes, it, it will ask for RDF. So it will say to the server, look, give me this fragment, uh, the URL of which I received, and I want to see an RDF version of that. And inside of the RDF version will be the exact same information, namely, um, you can create this data set by subject, predicate, object. I'll just show you what this looks like on a technical level. So if I take this um, URI, of the data set. And if I execute this from a command line as a client, I see the following. So basically, what I'll say is I want to have this data set in, in Turtle. And then I'll get an RDF version of the same page that we've just seen before. What we get back is a lot of data, as you can see. But also, if I scroll all the way to the top, right here, you might recognize something that looks like the same form we've seen in the browser. So this RDF version really explains to a client, you can create this data set based on a triple pattern. 
And this is how the client knows what it can do. Okay, first step. And now what you've also seen in the HTML version is that there is an approximation of the number of total triples. So even though each page only has 100 triples, uh, we can know how much there are in total. So you can see this right here on the HTML version. So in this case, there's um, 400 million, but let me maybe show you a very specific case. For instance, let me look at all those triples that have Padua as an uh, object. You see there are 600 in total. Now this is what we see as humans. If we now try this as a machine, so we get the same page, I'm copy pasting here, but now we ask for an RDF version. Indeed, we get back the same data, and what we get right at the bottom is the same approximation. So even though as data we only had the first 100 triples, the machine client also knows that there's 620 something in total. This is very important because we'll need this information. So indeed, we have an HTML, the client gets the same thing in RDF, an approximation of the number of metrics. What this allows a client to do is, it allows a client to split the query in the correct way. Because the client now realizes, okay, I cannot execute the whole complex query over this interface because the interface only supports triple patterns. This means that if I want to evaluate this particular complex query, I will have to split it in triple patterns myself. So the client indeed splits the query in triple patterns and it will ask each of the patterns to the server. So it will ask like, give me, give me the scientists, give me um, things that are born somewhere, give me things that are named Geneva. In, in all of the three cases, the client will receive the first 100 triples that match. It will also receive an approximation of the number of matches. In this case, it will receive the first page saying, well, there's 18,000 scientists, and here we have the first 100. Um, 100. Then it also say, look, here um, there's 600,000 things born somewhere. Here we have the first 100. It will also say, well, there's 12 things that are named Geneva, and here we have, well, there's not 100, here we have the first 12, because that's all there is. Now, based on this information, the client can, can decide how it will start the query. Will it start by looking at all of the scientists? Well, probably not, because there's 18,000 of them. Will it start by looking at um, all things that are born somewhere? Well, that would not be a good idea, because there's more than half a million of them. However, since only 12 things that are named Geneva, it might start with them. And this is exactly what we will do. So in the next step, we'll be looking at each entry. For instance, the city of Geneva in Switzerland is named Geneva. The city of Geneva in Alabama is also named Geneva and so on. So what it will do is it will start from all the results that it receives for this pattern. What will happen is that it will re-execute the query for the concrete case. So by picking Geneva, Switzerland right here, this part of the query has been solved. So what remains now is a Sparkle query that is less complex because it only has two components. So in this case, it will look for scientists that are born in a specific city of Geneva, Switzerland. So what the client has done now is it has broken down the complex query into a simpler query it will continue on repeating this mechanism until we see an answer. So this is the generic principle. The client sees what kind of queries the server supports. It breaks down the Sparkle query into these parts. And it uses the metadata to um, plan the query by starting with the simplest part of the query first. Now, if we execute this, um, you will see that this, if you try this yourself, you'll see that this takes approximately um, three seconds which is more than to take a Sparkle endpoint, because Sparkle endpoints do this generally in 0.3 seconds or something. However, this is consistent, because and we don't have to pray that the server is up. Triple pattern fragment servers have much higher availability. So the trade-off here is that even though queries go slower, the query times are much more consistent, and you don't have to fear for availability. Furthermore, even though the full query might take three seconds, Results, they come in streaming. So the first result already arrives after 0 0.5 seconds. So let me actually try to execute this exact um, query. 
I'll just um, try to copy paste it from my keynotes. If it allows me. Right here. So I'm copying this query. And now I go to client of link data fragments. So even though we are in the browser right here, this is not a server interface, this is a client interface, and everything runs locally. This is all JavaScript running right in my personal browser. So I'm copy pasting this query, let me maybe just reformat it. And when I click execute query, my browser will start executing it locally. So indeed, as, I, as I've shown you, the first results come streaming in, and the query itself takes about three seconds to execute. Note that in the results, we have people born in Geneva, Switzerland, but also in Geneva, Illinois, for instance. So in, in this case, looking at the results, we see that all those people are results for the query. In this case, um, Alfred Newton is a scientist born in Geneva. Now, how did my browser solve this query? Well, it did the exact same steps that I was explaining to you. For instance, um, it started by going to the fragments to look what is inside. What can I do? Well, it found out that it could query by a triple pattern. It was the first step. Then, as the, um, first, uh, as the second, third, and fourth step, it looked for each of the patterns. So it looked for, give me things named Geneva. Give me things that are scientists. Give me things that are born somewhere. And based on this, it has decided to start with the things named Geneva. It has continued from there. And what you see right here below is all the steps it needed. So you can see that my client required a lot of requests to complete the query. But each of those requests is very, very simple and did not bring down the server. So this is how we executed a query against a triple pattern fragment server. And even though this was a complex part of the query, we were still able to execute this. Now, um, just to give you an idea of all the things that are possible, I'll show you a couple of more um, complex queries. For instance, um, let's maybe um, start with something simple. Let's start um, by looking for writers that were born in Belgium. So um, I'm also asking this from Wikipedia. Give me people that are writers and that have as birthplace Belgium. So execute query. And indeed, I get back um, Belgian writers. OK, good. But what if I want to query um, multiple data sources? For instance, I guess uh, many of you have heard about VF, which is the uh, authority file for authors. What if I want to get Belgian writers from the Wikipedia and also have their VF identifier? Well, I can just as easily query multiple data sets. Now, my client will consult both the Wikipedia and VF. Let me ask for a more complex query. In this case, what I'll do is and I'll say, give me writers born in Belgium, and I also want to have their VF ID. Um, and I'll get the VF ID using same as, because that's how VF and Wikipedia are linked. And if I now click Execute Query, what I see is indeed, for instance, Amélie Mouton. This is, um, this is her name. And this is an identifier of a work of hers in VF. So if I click this. I jumped from Wikipedia to VF to find a work by Amelie Nonton. So this is how we can just query multiple data sets at once using the same principle with the client executing the queries. Um, I can um, even make things a bit more exciting even. Um, maybe I'm not just interested in Belgian writers, but something more prestigious. I'm interested in um, Belgians that have won a Nobel Prize. So if I do this, I get a list of people that have won a Nobel Prize. That's interesting. Let me now try to find those people from VF. So basically, give me the VF identifiers of people from Belgium that have won a Nobel Prize. And there we are. Now, why is this so interesting? Well, the thing is, this question cannot be solved by um, DBpedia or VF alone. Because if I ask VF about Nobel Prize winners, VF won't know anything because it only has authors and works, but does not know anything about Nobel Prizes. Whereas Wikipedia knows a lot about Nobel Prize winners, but does not know anything about VF identifiers. So by combining those two data sources, I can get the best of both worlds. 
Now, this is already interesting, but we can go even further. And um, remember that we were looking at the data set of the Harvard Library. Well, if they have published a data set as triple pattern fragments, we can also use them in a query. And now I'm going to show you a very cool query, which is this one. I'm looking for people that have won a Nobel Prize from Belgium. I want their VF ID, and based on their VF ID, I want to have their works, and I want to see what works are in Harvard Library. In other words, imagine this. I'm standing in front of Harvard Library, and I want to know, as a Belgian, which books they have that are written by Belgian Nobel Prize winners. You cannot solve this question by just the Harvard data, by just the DBP data, or by just VF. You really need to combine all three of them to get this information. Now, there's one more thing we need to do. We need to say that we want to query VF. So what I'll do is I'll go back to my Harvard data set, um, Harvard I meant. So I copy the Harvard URL, and I paste it in here. And now I'm saying I want to execute this query over DBpedia, VF, and Harvard. So again, if I click Execute Query, this will all happen in my browser locally. It will look for books by Belgian Nobel Prize winners that are available in the Harvard Library. So I click Execute Query. And indeed, I see the works coming in. So um, let's check if, there's, um, if they're correct, in fact, because um, I could just be, um, you know, they could just be um, random results. Let me have a look at this case. For instance, there's um, Maurice Madlink. So let's have a look. Does this guy actually fit the profile? OK, he's a writer. Makes sense. And from Belgium, indeed. And has he won a Nobel Prize winner? Uh, has he won a Nobel Prize? Indeed, he has won the um, Nobel Prize for Literature in 1911. So, Caden fits. Now, is this his VF identifier? Yes, it is an identifier for a book that he wrote in VF. Okay, that makes sense. So, this gives us the book in VF. And now, let's see if we actually end up with the same book in Harvard Library. There we go. So this is a book written by Maurice Maeterlinck in Harvard Library, and Maurice Maeterlinck is a Belgian Nobel Prize winner. So this is how we can solve very complex queries using a very simple interface over multiple linked data interfaces. I don't think that you've seen this happen before with a Spark of Endpoints. Well, neither have I. Um, querying over multiple endpoints with Spark of Endpoints is, is very, very rare. Even though it might be faster, it would be more expensive, and it would not be as reliable because we would have this frequent downtime. As you can see right here, it's not a problem and to execute um, this query over triple pattern fragments. So this was um, the practical part. I will, um, in the presentation, you have the links to try queries like this yourself. If you want to see a couple of examples, I can also send them around. But you can basically play with this and try different variations. Try real-world queries over linked data on the public web, because all of this is really happening on the public web that that is applied. OK, good. My presentation has um, gone to the end, but this is not what I wanted, so let me just rewind. Where was I? Ah, yes, I wanted to show you some graphs. So this was the last slide that we've seen. Um, We've executed this query, so we know that it, um, it did happen in a couple of seconds, and that the results come in a streaming way. Now, um, we have also measured our solution, because I'm, um, I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher, and my job is to not only to make interfaces like this, but also to measure how good they are. So we've seen how they performed, and what you see in this graph is um, these are sparkle endpoints, and this is our triple pattern fragments client server solution. And what we've done is we've executed benchmark queries, lots of them, with uh, num different numbers of clients. So going from just one client to 240 clients. And what we see that if we have few clients, well, Sparkle endpoints are much, much faster. But as the number of clients increases, you see that Sparkle endpoints start performing worse and worse. And note this is a logarithmic scale, so it's really, really bad. Whereas that the triple pattern fragment solution remains much more constant. Even though it's not a goal to have the best performance, so we're not interested in really being the fastest, you see that if lots and lots of clients are querying the system, we're actually not doing that bad. But again, our goal is not speed, our goal is availability and low cost. 
Of course, the trade-off is also that um, there's much more traffic to the server. That's logical because instead of just asking one complex question, the client asks lots of smaller questions so more data is, is sent to the server. However, as you can see here, it is quite okay and even if you have a high number of clients, you get fewer questions to the server. Why is that? Well, that's because lots of the traffic can be cached. The majority of traffic in our system is handled by the cache because lots of those simple questions, they come back again and again. Take the example, um, I was interested in, in Belgian uh, Nobel Prize winners. You might be interested in American uh, Nobel Prize winners. Even though we have different questions, um, the part of our question is still the same. What happens with a Sparkle endpoint is that each unique question is totally different and needs a, a different answer from the server. But because each client breaks down queries into smaller parts, the chance that some of those parts will be reused across different queries is much higher. So this is why we benefit much more from caching. And as you all know, the web has been designed for caching. But of course, the main thing is that the server for triple panel fragments is much less expensive. Already with around 20 clients, um, the Sparkle endpoint solution used almost all of the available CPU for all server cores, whereas the triple pattern fragment solution did not use all CPU even if you had lots of clients. That said, this is also partly because the main bottleneck is bandwidth, not CPU power, but again, bandwidth on the web is very cheap and very cash. So what we see here is the effect of servers enabling clients to be intelligent instead of trying to be intelligent themselves. So the semantic web vision we believe in is one of intelligent clients, not one of intelligent servers, because intelligent servers do not really scale as these numbers show. So we've seen now a linked data fragments framework and a new interface built using this framework, namely triple pattern fragments. We've seen how we can query multiple linked data sources live on the web using triple pattern fragments. And the final thing I want to discuss with you is if you want to get started with this yourself, how can you do that? So let's talk about publishing linked data at low cost. How can you do this yourself? Well, the good news is it's absolutely straightforward because servers only need to implement a very simple API. Indeed, the only question that clients can ask is just triple patterns. They cannot ask any more complex questions, so as such, implementing a server cannot be very hard. Even better news is that you don't need a Sparkle endpoint, even not as a backend. So while it's possible to have a triple pattern fragments interface with a Sparkle endpoint in the back, it's not necessary. That's because there is the HDD compressed triple format. So HDD stands for header dictionary triples. This is a compressed format for um, any kind of RDF. And the benefit of this format is that it's really, really good for triple patterns. So this means that you don't need a database server as a backend. You can just um, compress your triples into an HDD file, and the server can run on top of this HDD file, no Sparkle endpoint needed. All the software to do this is Source. So even though the interface is very simple, you don't even have to build it yourself. You can just use existing software. We have um, implementations for many different languages. Um, we ourselves maintain the JavaScript implementations for Node.js, so for the server, and also a Java implementation. But other people have built implementations in um, Perl, in Python. There's um, on the website like datafragments.org. There's a whole list of um, all the software that's available. So there will surely be something that's interesting for you to get started with. You can just use one of the out-of-the-box servers if you like. What, what you need to do to build the your linked data sets? Um, well, it's just three steps. The first step is um, you convert your data sets to the compressed HDD format. So this is just a utility that converts your, um, let's say, RDF turtle file into HDD. That's the first step. The second step is to set up a server and to configure it to use the data set that you've just created. And the third step is to expose this server on the public web. Let me walk you through all of those three steps. Um, I've given some technical details. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, if you're not a technical person yourself, normally your system administrator should have no trouble setting this up. First step is to convert your data set. 
So basically, I'm assuming right here that you have a data set in turtle format. So we install the RDF to AGT utility, which you can download from our website. And then you say, well, convert a data set. The format is turtle. The input is this one. And the output is an AGT file. Depending on, on the size of your data set, this can take a couple of minutes or a couple of hours to run. But then you're all set. And if you don't want to do this yourself, you can also just use a lot laundromat infrastructure. Remember I was talking about the laundromat, which is an online website. Well, what you can do there is you can actually just submit your data sets as Turtle, and they will convert it into AGD all for you. So that's the second possibility. Then um, the second step is to install a linked data fragment server and configure your data source. Here I'm giving examples for Node.js, so just get a command to install the LDF server command globally. And then you set up a, a config file um, and you say, well, run the LDF server with this config file. In this case, I'm running it on port 5000 and I'm giving it four um, CPUs to work with. You can change, of course, those details, but this is a typical example of what you do. What does this configuration file look like? Well, it's really simple. You just list the data source. In this case, you say, well, for instance, I want to host DBpedia. This is a name. I'm using HTT, and here you can find my HTT file. It's as simple as that. And one server can host uh, multiple data files. For instance, in the, um, the Harvard example, was actually hosted on our server, which has lots of different data sets. You can just configure multiple of them. And this software right here is actually the JavaScript software that you can configure with this JSON file. So you install the server, configure data source, and then the server is running. And actually, you're already good to go then. But, of course, if you really want to publish this on a public web, it's good to set up um, a reverse proxy, as it's called. So basically, what you do is the LDF server is running in, in the back as an application server. You put a proxy server in front of that to do caching and so on. And this means that um, you can also have different servers running on one machine. So you just run the, so either you you don't use a proxy server and you just deploy the RDF server on port 80 and that will just work, or you can put a server like Apache or an Nginx in front of it. Then you can also benefit from caching. And actually, I recommend the second option, but the first one can be good for uh, just testing the system really quickly. Um, for, this is an example of configuration file, and uh, this is Nginx, for instance, where you say, well, actually, I want to publish my data on this host, but internally, my LDF server is running on port 5000, and this will basically forward all traffic for this address to your local server. If you need it, you can uh, copy-paste this configuration file. But again, um, this might sound quite technical, but this is something you can just give to your IT administrator, and he or she can put a web server in front of the LDF server. And again, and actually, if you don't want to do all those steps, you can just use a lot of laundromat because not only do they provide an HTT conversion service, they also gladly host your data set for you. You can just submit your data there and they will host it. But if you want to do it yourself, it's always possible. So the three steps are convert your data into HTT, um, set up the LDF server, and if necessary, put a web server in front of that to make it cacheable for the public web. So this concludes the third part of the talk. Um, we've talked about link data fragments, the conceptual framework, the concrete triple pattern fragments interface. Um, we've married uh, multiple link data sources live on the web. And I've also given you a couple of pointers to start publishing your own link data. So basically, I want to say uh, one final thing to you, and that is um, you don't have any excuses left now to publish your data on the web. It used to be the case that it was hard to publish linked data. Yes, but a Sparkle endpoint is expensive, the data dump is, is so cumbersome. Well, actually, all those excuses have vanished. You can now publish your data in a really simple way. It doesn't cost a lot. And if you do this, people can already start querying your data right now, even in combination with other data sets. And I've given the Harvard Library example. Well, we set this data online, and the moment it was online, we could start making complex queries, do things like give me books by Belgian Nobel Prize winners inside of Harvard Library. You can have the same thing with your library if you just follow those three steps to publish your data in this very low-cost triple pattern fragments interface. That said, I've come at the end of my story. I hope that you've enjoyed this talk, and I'll be more than happy to take any of your questions.
Thank you, Ruben. Um, you can in, insert your questions. Uh, you'll see um, uh, a form there to uh, uh, to do so. And so, while I'm waiting for um, for some questions to come in, uh, Ruben, what's been the um, uh, if you can you give us a little sense of of when this work was completed and what kind of uptake there's been and what kind of response um, uh, in terms of implementation that you're seeing. So um, I started this work in the fall of 2013, so it's now a little over two years. Um, basically, I started experimenting myself first locally, then we presented this at the World Wide Web Conference um, in April 2014, and then we started to have the first couple of reactions. And mainly, people in the audience thought, okay, this is nice, but the query is going to take several hours or minutes to complete. But people were really surprised to see that actually it worked quite well and quite fast. So this already um, gave some impulse to people trying stuff. Um, then um, 2014, towards the end, I presented this to the International Semantic Web Conference, and people were really, really curious. And in fact, one year later in the International Semantic Web Conference of 2015, already several other researchers had written papers that used linked data fragments. In the meantime, in 2015, we gained lots of interest from um, people from the libraries, museums community, showing interest in publishing their linked data because finally there was something that kind of um, yeah, gives them what was promised for years. Um, so they've been told for years you should publish your data, and, and now they have a framework to do so. So we really start to see uptake of people trying small experiments. In terms of data sets, with a lot of laundromat, we have now a couple of hundred thousands of them on the web. We also see a couple of smaller initiatives of, of people trying to publish their own data. DBpedia is on board, um, and lots of developers have starting have started to write clients and servers in their own languages. So now we have, I think, um, about ten implementations of both the server and the client in different languages. So it's I'd say it's really going well, and the interest continues to increase as far as I'm seeing. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Barbara, uh, what to, which you may have partially answered here, but what technology stack language is needed on the server to support the LDF server? Um, so there's different options. Um, so the, the option that we use most is, is, um, is JavaScript. So we work, so our server is implemented on, on top of, um, of Node.js. So you can just install Node.js, run the server, and, and then that's it, because you don't need a backend server, um, because you can use the AGT compressed file format. However, if you have data that changes frequently, you might still want to have a Sparkle endpoint as a data source, and then you can use this um, as a backend. Now again, um, JavaScript Node.js is not the only backend. We have um, several of them that we maybe briefly show this on the website. So um, the server implementation, we have JavaScript, Python, Perl, Ruby, PHP, Java, and NetKernel. So you can choose any of these as your technology stack. The next question, uh, again for Barbara. How does this technology accommodate additional properties belonging uh, to the same subject? For example, when the subject represents an object of interest. Um, so. It does not on, on the server, because indeed, um, if I'm talking about um, Einstein, for instance, huh, I'll only see triples that have Einstein directly as a subject. So the server does not answer that, but there are such questions are answered by the client. So if I just go back um, to fresh client installation, if I want to see more things from Einstein, I just write a query. So let me just... Um, select everything, and here I'm saying, for instance, um, starting from a triple where Einstein is the subject, give me more triples. So, for instance, give me. Um, um, so I'm saying now, give me triples where Einstein is the subject, and also of those triples, look further, starting from the objects, give me more triples. So here, what I'll see, for instance, is. Um, that Einstein have, has won an, um, no, that's not an interesting one. Let me see a more interesting case. Um, for instance, here in this case, we see that Einstein has won an award, the Copley Medal, and the Copley Medal has label in Spanish, Medalla Copley, for instance. So this is a case of the data not being grouped with one subject, 
but the client is able to follow the links and give more information and expand the knowledge that uh, it shows. Okay, another question from Dwayne. Uh, you mentioned that data dumps suffer from going out of date. It seems this approach gets leveraged from, uh, from aggregating or caching of, of the smaller fragments. How do you manage changes in source data? Okay, um, so um, that's um, a question of multiple parts. First of all, indeed, um, data dumps go often out, out of date, and the reason for that is not, well, there's the several reasons. One of them is, of course, the, the update frequency. Sometimes they're only updated, let's say, every month or so, but even if they would be updated every second, a client still has to download the whole data set every time before it can answer a single question. So they will be outdated by nature just because of, of their size. You can simply not download the data set anew every minute. What we have here with triple patterns is that um, all of the responses are, are, are pretty small. For instance, um, the Einstein page, I mean, it just loads in, in a fraction of, of a second. Um, so if something changes on, on the server side, I mean, it's easy to, to get fresh data because it, it is so small. Now, um, in order to make this work smoothly, you have to set up some configuration. So if, you, if, if, your data, if your data changes every day, so to speak, it's still feasible to generate every morning an HGD file of, or every night. So you can just update every day. Every day sorry. Um, if your data changes more frequently, then I would suggest to have a Sparkle endpoint in the back. So that's one thing. The only thing that remains is you have to set up your, your cache correctly as well. If you know your data is going to change frequently, then you cannot cache your data for too long. Let's say that you have to invalidate the cache every hour. So summarizing, it is possible to work with data that changes um, because the response sizes are very small, but you have to have the right backend configuration and you have to make sure that the cache is also following the update frequency. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was muted there. Um, can you tell us how the Harvard Library data made its way into uh, linkdatafragments.org? Is it based on data from Library Cloud? Um, actually, um, I, I did not do the conversion myself, so um, I cannot tell you by heart. But um, what I think that happens so, um, is that Harvard offers a dump. We downloaded the dump. We convert it into AGT and we offer it on, on our website. So um, we also mentioned that the license there, but basically we just reuse data dump in this case. Now this is of course on our preferred scenario. Our preferred scenario is that people host their own endpoints because we don't want to become the bottleneck, the single point of failure. But as, as just just to show that's possible, we've done it for Harvard, but um, in the end we hope that everybody do this for, for themselves. And in fact it already starts uh, happening. Thank you. Uh, can a client blend data sources that use fragments and data sources that do not use fragments? Um, yes, that would be possible. Um, it's not implemented in my client yet, but this is there's nothing um, stopping client from doing this. So if you remember when I explained the querying, I said, well, the client gets a fragment, looks inside to see what it can do. Well, this whole principle can be used to support different kinds of, of interfaces. So uh, either an interface that is not triple patterns or a Sparkle endpoint and so on. So it's possible in theory. Um, and in fact, this is part of my um, ongoing research on um, to implement this. But um, the current client is not supported yet, but this is a neat or, or long-term strategy to support lots of different interfaces. If you remember the axis that I've shown, we, 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 I mean, we added a third point on the axis, but we're not interested in just a third point. We want to keep on adding multiple points so everybody can have their own balance and then such a clients with multiple interfaces will be an important point of that. Uh, thank you, Ruben. Uh, is it possible to do queries that include wildcards? For, for example, searching for Robert would find, among other uh, results, a person named uh, David Robert Jones. Very good question. It is possible, but with just a triple pattern fragment interface, it will be slow. And this is actually a um, general answer. All Sparkle questions are possible with this interface. Some of them will be very slow. Now, um, this is something that we accept uh, between quotation marks. 
and it's actually a core part of a strategy because the Sparkle endpoint philosophy has always been like all queries should work fast no matter what clients ask and this does not scale. So we say okay, the common queries we solve reasonably fast but there will be queries that will be slow. That said, um, in our research we have developed an interface that, is, that goes beyond triple pattern fragments that has specifically a support for um, wildcards. If you're interested in that on the linked data fragments website, if you go to publications, you'll find a section in extensions right there. And this one is called substring filtering. So we extended the triple pattern fragment interface. So we made a new point on this axis and we added support for wildcards. This means that the server becomes a little more complex, but then queries with wildcards go faster. So this is also an example of what you can do if you indeed make the uh, server more complex. But then again, the question is always, how far do you want to go on the server side and how, um, are you, and how much are you willing to sacrifice to have faster queries? That, that's a big question of the whole LinkedIn fragment story. Okay, well thank you, uh, Ruben. This is very, very interesting and um, obviously addresses a significant problem um, uh, in the linked data world, and and one other pe another piece in trying to solve the problem of, of ubiquitous and quick access uh, to this data. That's the end of our questions. So, Ruben, I want to thank you very much. Uh, this very very interesting talk, um, and I want to thank our audience uh, for attending and for. Um, those of you that have asked questions. Um, I'm going to turn this over for a moment to uh, to Stefan to talk to you a little bit about the recording and other aspects. So again, Ruben, thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben and Stuart. For those still in the webinar, slides and the recording will be made available within 48 hours of today's live broadcast. And that is all for me. So again, we'd like to thank Ruben and uh, Stuart for today's webinar. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, bye-bye.